It's Reality Check with Craig Price. I'm an idiot. Four minutes in and I'm already wrong. I'm like a monkey. Hello, look at me. You're like a beautiful mind. I'm more like Forrest Gump. (laughs) Craig Price is the man. I knew it. Craig, shut up. It's Reality Check with Craig Price. This week, Steve Hughes discusses his ALA session on engaging presentation. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for listening. This week, I am highlighting a fellow ALA breakout speaker and friend, Steve Hughes. What is ALA? It is the Association of Legal Administrators, and they are having their national conference and expo this April 2nd through the 5th in Denver at the Colorado Convention Center. I will be there on April 4th presenting two sessions. The first one, The Realist Guide to Getting a Grip on Negativity at 1015, and the other, Leading from All Sides, The Realist Guide to Leadership at 245. My guest today, Steve, will be presenting his Captivate presentations that engage and win over today's distracted audiences on Wednesday, April 5th at 3 p.m. You can go to alanet.org for more info and to register for this great educational event. Now, I've known Steve for years, and he is a great speaker. And in his session, you'll discover how to instantly build rapport with others, use your nervousness to your advantage, and handle questions with confidence. In fact, we talk about those things in this very podcast. So let's learn how to captivate and give engaging presentations with Steve Hughes. Well, it's good to talk to you because we've been a couple uh, years since you've been to Houston and you stayed in the worst area of town, in which I apologize when you stayed at that best western in the middle <laughs> of the ghetto. But I'm a classy guy. You are a classy guy. That's the one thing. That's why you being in that area, it was downtown adjacent, but I would definitely would say if you're from Texas, you would have been armed. You're, <laughs> but you're going to be doing a, a presentation a session at the ALA conference, the Association of Legal Administrators. What do you see that most people do wrong when they start thinking about making a presentation? I think the biggest mistake is they put too much of the focus on themselves. I mean, naturally, we all get nervous and we want to do a good job, but... You can imagine that if if any kind of athlete or performer just thinks about themselves and not the team or what they're doing it for, uh, they wind up in trouble. And so I say focus on the audience. They don't really care about you nearly as much as you think. And there's that whole spotlight delusion where people think everyone's just zeroing in on them and picking them apart and dressing them down. And they can know they're worried about the email they didn't send and they have a lot of stuff to do back at the office or whatever. So just give them a good show. Focus on the audience, and um, and you do a much better job. I think one of the reasons why they end up focusing on themselves a lot is you hear, well, you have to have stories. You have to have uh, personal stories about yourself. And so that translates to people who don't present, present a lot as, oh, I've got to talk about me. So how can, yeah. you, how can you tell the stories about your life and still make it about the audience? Because I think that's where the confusion lies. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think I'd say yes and no do – Feel free to tell stories about yourself and your own personal experience, but I always say make sure the point or the reason for even saying the story relates back to them. And I always, you know, make sure you you stick the landing when you when you wrap up the story. Even as you're telling the story, don't be afraid to dial the audience in from time to time with a question or two. You know, say, hey, can you imagine what it'd be like if this happened, or you know, imagine what would happen next. You know, that kind of thing. But then also don't be afraid to tell stories that happened just out in the hinterland. You, you hear something interesting uh, on the radio or read uh, a cool blog or something that's out there that, that relates back to your topic or to what the people are interested in. It's okay, obviously, with proper attribution to, uh, to tell about something you heard about uh, you know, in the news or even a, an analogy from a movie. I mean, if I say to folks, it doesn't really matter really what the genesis is of the genesis is of your of your story as long as it's audience focused delivers a point and is is entertaining well my guest today is steve hughes and you've got a great breakout session that's going to be on wednesday april 5th at three o'clock that's where it's scheduled right now Uh, i know that could change because they changed mine Uh, it's going to be captivate (laughs) presentations that engage and win over today's distracted audience how distracted are audiences? Because I don't find them that distracting, but maybe that's because I act like an idiot and draw everybody's attention all the time. <laughs> well, I tell you, whatever you're doing there, keep that up. I just think back, and some of us can remember, maybe not, really before the smartphone. We had cell phones for a long time, but really when smartphones came along, you have the world in your pocket or your purse, and it's hard to 
it's hard to stay focused. So the second someone gets bored or even gets slightly distracted or the, you know, it, it buzzes in their pocket, you know, or on the table, you can't help but look down. It's kind of a dopamine hit. And so people love that. It could, it's a possibility of great news. It's a possibility of bad news. And we love that rush. And so that's why I say, um, you know, I, when I talk to other speakers and other presenters, they'll say things like, oh, I want a lot of live tweeting during my program. So they'll say, hey, you know, this is so cool. It's really awesome. And I always say, I want almost absolutely none. Meaning if they're so engaged and entranced in what's going on on stage, I don't want them to stop and, and tell other people how great it is. And the other, the example I use is, you know, we all have friends who get married and they head off to a honeymoon. I don't think a whole lot of live tweeting goes on on honeymoons uh, just because hopefully you're having a great time. You're not going to stop and say, I'm having such a great time to tweet about it. So um, I think that the, the key component is for the speakers to be, to be dynamic, to not be afraid to shake things up, to go off script, to get out into the audience themselves. Don't stand behind a giant piece of wood uh, you know, just just don't be afraid to engage them in any way, shape, or form. Well, I try not to worry about if they're going to use their phones or not because it's just one of these things that that's the way life is now. It's one of these things you have to exactly. So, so when they say don't do it, well, you know that people are going to because it's especially what we're going to be doing. We're, you're going to be on a yeah. Wednesday at three o'clock. Right. That's a work day, and as much as oh, they're absolutely. there to learn. As much as they're there to learn, they're also, you know, have to respond to things, especially legal administrators, because they're the hub of the entire law firm. So I understand right. that. I just don't want them to make a big spectacle out of checking emails. Oh, that's or, a good point. Or if they leave the room, yeah, if they got to get be, up. Yeah, I always say be secretive about it. You act like you're you're listening. Um, or, or I will say I really don't tell people anymore to turn off your phones or you know because you're like you said, Craig. They're they're going to check them. They're going to be doing it constantly, but. What I'll often do, though, is I'll use that to my advantage. I will many times give out my personal cell phone number at the front of the program, up front. I put up on the screen and say, hey, please text me throughout. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, a vicious personal attack, um, you know, a sports score, whatever you want to do. And so I figure they're going to have their phones in their hands anyway. Why not use that as almost like jujitsu leverage uh, to your advantage? So basically you're daring them to call you. You're daring them to use I am. I am. I'm totally daring them, exactly. And by the way, I say this to folks all the time. If you are, because I'll often speak at colleges or universities, law schools and stuff. If, let's say you're an administrator, you do a personal cell phone number. I get that. That's really scary to folks because they don't want that 3 o'clock in the morning stalker kind of thing. Uh, you can get a free Google Voice account, or there's a whole host of, of other kinds of uh, free numbers you can get, and you can have that number, that, that Google Voice account number, forwarded to your cell phone. So you give out a number, a real number, but it's not your cell phone number. You can turn that on and off all the time. So I say if you ever want to kind of go down that route, feel free to give out that, that free Google Voice account number, and then and then you can have the same joy of getting feedback. I get calls. This is actually cool. I get uh, texts and calls all the time after my program two, three weeks later with people saying, hey, I tried that out. It was great. Or, hey, you mentioned that one thing, and how does that work? And so it's a, just a nice way to keep the conversation going with your audience well after the program's over. And you are using that number right now. That's how you called in to me today. So, <laughs> ding that's exactly right. Yes, that's perfect. Uh, one of the things you're going to talk about is instantly rebuilding rapport with others. What is a good way to get them right out the out the gate? Because one of the things that I have problems with is doing that is is a big jump in. That's why I'm really good yeah. befo before the presentation, even before as they're coming in, as they're sitting down. I'm engaging them yeah. because I know that right. I don't have the gangbuster opener, um, which is okay yeah. if you're already if they're already engaged with you before you even start talking. Right. No, I, I think you you're nailing the head right there, Craig. I think. Whatever you can, and some people are, are good at this, whether they're introvert or not, or extrovert, is yeah, shaking hands, smiling, getting to know people. And, and you, I'm sure you found that the more of those hands you've, you've shaken or said hey to or had a conversation with, those end up being some of the most engaged people in your audience because they have a vested interest in you now that they did not have prior. The other thing I do say is, again, and this varies, so I want to kind of be clear, but let's say someone is not there to introduce you. Um, there probably will be someone at ALA, but let's say someone is not there to introduce you. Then I say, when you start off, please do not start off about yourself. Don't introduce yourself. In fact, 
uh, obviously borrow a page from Kurt Vonnegut, you know, the writer who um, was once asked in a, he was teaching a, a class on, you know, writing. And he said a, a technique he would often employ is to actually write your manuscript. So write out your speech. And then he said, he tears off the first three pages that just, they go away. And now page four is page one. And his thought is, I want the readers to jump in and almost like have to catch up to what's already happening versus it was a sunny day and, uh, you know, the birds were chirping in Paris and, you know, whatever, just you jump in and, and things are happening. So I always say to folks, don't introduce yourself right away, especially if someone already introduced you a moment ago, but let's say no one introduced you whatsoever. Start off with something that doesn't have to be whiz bang or crazy, but just either it's a provocative quote, it's a rhetorical question, it's a, it's a shocking statistic, or just start telling a story. I mean, literally. So three and a half years ago, something happened on a Wednesday night that changed my life forever. I mean, no one's going to say, shut up, speaker. You know, they want to hear, okay, what changed your life? What happened? You know, or they, so tell that story or, um, you know, maybe, maybe quote somebody famous or not famous, but just, just throw out the quote. But the whole point is any one of those things I just said is hopefully a little unexpected. Maybe they couldn't have seen it coming and it sets up your topic and draws them in. It's almost like that you, you start on page four versus a slow ramp up. And then once you've given something to the audience, either something thought provoking, maybe something that gives them a smile, something that, that challenges them, something that, wow, that ripped, you know, ripped me right out of my seat. You give that to them first. That's a very audience focused. It's a giving, you know, generous kind of a thing. They will then at least temporarily want to pay you back with their attention. And it's at that point I say to people, do a very brief introduction of yourself. I mean, the minimum required so they won't know this. Someone just walked in off the street and began talking. You know, by the way, blah, blah, blah. So you do your cool intro and you say, by the way, I'm, I'm Craig Price and I do this, this, and this. And gosh, I'm so glad to be here. Let's keep going. You know, just almost a, let me mention myself, but it's really not that important, even though it is. And then the whole thing is about the audience. And I think you do that combined with, and it's hard to do this on a podcast, but I always talk about how folks really miss an opportunity to engage their audience properly with their eyes um, through what I call eye-to-eye -eye contact. And that's, uh, that's basically having a conversation with individuals in your audience, not groups of people. You know, so you look out, pick someone in the audience, and have a brief, you know, five, ten second conversation with just them, pause, go to somebody else, and just boom, 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 over and over and over. It's a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations. Whether your audience is 20 people or 200 or 2,000, it works in any venue. And people can't look away, you know? So it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. But the main thing is from a content perspective, giving them something about them versus making it about you. And I think that's why it's important to at least contact a couple people beforehand. I mean, just in the room as they walk in, because now you've, yep. you've yep. already got someone and you can make eye contact with, and it's not going to be 100% awkward for either one of you. Because you've already established a point. quick connection. So with introductions, yeah. there's uh, I, I hear two different theories from speakers because there's some people who believe you have to have an amazing introduction to set a tone and, uh -huh. to, and to prove your credibility. Yeah. And I'm the kind of person that it's, I tell them right out, look, you don't even have to just, – just say my mm -hmm. name. Uh, I don't really care about right. that because – any introduction you give me doesn't matter because I still have to prove whatever is on that piece of paper that you just said. So if I say I'm a wonderful expert who's amazing Amen. and talented and funny, yeah, right. that doesn't mean anything if that doesn't happen in the next three seconds. I, hey, Greg, you and I are a brother from another mother. I completely agree with that, a, a, a thousand percent if that's possible. Or I'll go down to a hundred percent if that's all we're doing. Yeah, we're mathematically um, sound here. Yeah, because you're right. Imagine just right now, for anyone here, you, me, you know, audience, think of the greatest speaker you ever heard in the world, ever. Now, if that person had a horrible introduction, does that mean, oh, they're going to stink? You know, these people, this person sucks. No, it's, it's just I think the introducer is kind of a chump or they went on a little long or whatever. But I think you're right. I think people are now sitting there, regardless of age, they're saying, okay, chop, chop. I don't care where that person went to school or how many, if they've been on Oprah or whatever, you know, just be good to me now. You better, you better deliver. So I'm with you. I say if you can say my name correctly without stuttering, um, or, uh, you know, he was a nice guy or uh, my favorite introduction, Craig is, is about two sentences long where someone says, Hey, this is Steve Hughes. And one of our bo boards of directors folks here saw him at a conference a year ago. And so we got to bring this guy in. Here he is. That boom, that would make me happy, you know, a little street cred, but, uh, but yeah, regardless of what they would say about you or me or anyone, 
unless it, it's your job then the second that introduction is over to come in and deliver a great program. So I'm, I'm with you. I think that we make too much of a, a big deal out of introductions because um, I, I just think it's, it's a nice thing to have, but it is not a make or break situation. It's also one of the few parts of your, your presentation you have absolutely no control over. Because yes, you, yeah. you can you can say that you know here read this, but that doesn't mean they're going to do it well or they actually know how to <laughs> how to speak very well. I've had people butcher right. it as, in awful ways. Sure. I've, I've had people heckle me in sure. the middle of it. I mean, that's when the person reads it and he goes, "Oh, he was a comedian," and they say it in a way that's like, oh, "I don't believe oh. this. I've met this guy. He's not that funny," you know. Right. You. It's, right. So I try not to worry about that too much. But I know that one thing that hits everybody, and I think this still hits even good speakers who have a lot of experience. And that is nerves. And I feel that oh, if, yeah. if you're even a little bit nervous, that's a good thing because that tells you that you care. Once you've become blasé and you don't get nervous at all, that's, yep. that's when I worry about a speaker because that means they just don't care anymore. So how can we yeah, use, I would agree. How can we use some of that nervousness to our advantage? Uh, well, I recommend uh, heavy drinking. Uh, ha-ha. For the audience, no, uh, right? But I, I would say... But you actually almost said a, a quote I use all the time from Hale Irwin, you know, the former uh, U.S. Open golf champion. He said something along the lines of, the only time I get nervous before a match is when I'm not nervous. In other words, you know, I, I want to get – he wants to be a little bit nervous. I know even Michael Jordan and other folks have said that that nervous energy is what kind of keys you up to really do a great job to be a superstar. And so I always say to folks, try to use that to your advantage. And a couple of things is simply is to, is to not downplay it as if it's not happening. Say, so, okay, that's cool. That, my nerves are a sign that, that I want to do a good job. You want to perform well. And so let that be, a, instead of that being a weakness, go ahead and say to yourself, gosh, that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. And so we've heard all sorts of theories out there. One of them is very popular is the, the power posing, and, and you can look at that. It's a great TED Talk by Amy Cuddy, and, and there's some great stuff there. A couple of things I like to do for folks who are really nervous is do a thing called power priming. And power priming is kind of a neat thing where uh, you basically think of a time in your life when you were really, you felt powerful. You know, it could be, and ideally it's in an interpersonal situation. Let's say you were a part of a committee and you changed their mind, or you, uh, you won over a disgruntled customer, or you uh, repaired a relationship, or you did something where you felt, okay, that was pretty awesome, or, or you made a really great point and you, uh, you carried the day at, at some particular event or whatever it might be. And then take literally two minutes. I mean, nothing more than that. Just take a couple, a couple minutes, a piece of paper, heck, type it into your phone, doesn't matter, and just write out kind of what happened, how you felt, like oh, I felt powerful because this, this, and this. And some great research out of Columbia Business School had folks do this exact power priming exercise before a big-time interview. So these are folks interviewing for real jobs. You know, they're, they're scared and, and a lot on the line. And they found that the folks who power primed were able to feel more confident. They were able to take that nervous energy and, and kind of put themselves out there. They had a little more of a risk taker. They, they were able to grab onto some of that power and what was cool is the interviewers who did not know who did the power priming or who didn't weren't able to actually put their finger on why the person was, was better, but they said, man, they seemed on their game. They brought their, their A-level effort. Uh, they seemed to be really engaged, that sort of thing. So, so those kinds of techniques are cool. People also will uh, listen to music. You find your favorite song in the world that gets your blood pumping. And just seriously, you, moments before you get on stage, go to a quiet hallway or – Go to the bathroom wherever and just pop in your earphones, your headphones, and uh, and listen to that tune that just will have an amazing ability to to elevate your your emotions. Um, and I also say to folks is the walking around part. Maybe sitting down is not the best thing. You should be walking the room. You know, the, all those little tiny things can add up to helping you feel more confident and being really ready to rock and roll. And the final thing I say to people is go ahead and visualize yourself kicking butt on stage, even if you don't feel that good, even if it's the first time you ever gave this speech, even if it's a career-defining presentation, that if you don't do well, the world will explode, which, by the way, rarely happens. Um, I don't think it's it, happened yet. I don't think the world has exploded yeah, that's, once. Yeah, that's a great point. The more, it, I, you're right. I think we should say it hasn't happened, as best I can tell. <laughs> and, and visualize yourself 
I mean, picture yourself walking up there. Picture yourself striding across the stage. Picture yourself, whether you're grabbing the microphone or you, or you turn to face the audience for the first time, and then picture them with smiles on their faces. Picture them leaning forward in their chairs. Picture you know, how you'll feel at the end when they, when they applaud and how you step off. And another great study was done with weightlifters. Now, this was kind of neat. They looked at you know, MRI studies and things of weightlifters, and they found that when um, – when weightlifters would, would visualize themselves lifting weights, the same brain kind of processes were happening as they were as if they were really lifting weights. Now, they didn't actually get, become stronger because no weights were being lifted, but they found those who visualized versus those who didn't actually were able to perform better. And so I thought, our brains are these great supercomputers that are just waiting to be fired up and pointed in the right direction. Just don't be afraid to, to take it out for a spin and, and get out of your own way. And I find that, obviously, the more experience you get doing these things, the, the calmer you'll get. Like I said, you, know, you may not get 100% zen, but you're going to get calmer. And I, that's right. why I always tell other speakers, if you have the opportunity to do something outside of your expertise, and that doesn't mean taking a yep. sales speech when, when you're a leadership speaker. I mean, MC, <laughs> right. I, I mean emceeing an event or helping out a, a yeah. charity auction or like what I do that's helped me immensely is these Comic-Cons that I do. Because they're very high risk, which means there's going to be a lot of stuff going right. wrong at all times, but there's very low consequence. And also, it's just the amount, right. the amount of experience I get in a weekend would take me years because we are in a very lucky environment when we speak. Most of the time, we oh. have a meeting planner. Most of the time, we have someone looking out for us to make sure that everything's taken care of. And all we kind of have to do is a quick double check and get on stage where these Comic-Cons there's little or no notice and you've got to change gears and you've got to interview people you've never met before yep. or even heard of before. Right. Um, so I've learned right. that if, you know, jumping up on stage is not a big deal for me anymore. I, I mean, I'm more nervous about doing a good job versus is this going to be a fiasco or can I even do it? It's more of, I hope it turns out well because it's a give and take. There's two people involved, but I encourage all kinds of, you know, things that you wouldn't normally do, things that you may not even ever do for your business but get out there and do those things just for the fear factor alone. Oh, I 100% agree. I keep it keeps you on your toes, and even you know, Craig. I know I followed you and your podcast and some of the stuff and and things you put on Facebook. I think it's so cool to see you put yourself out there, and even some of the celebrities you've met and some of the relationships you've started that that would not have happened had you not gotten out of your comfort zone. And now, of course, now my old man brain is kicking in, but I forgot who said. You should do at least one thing a day that scares you, you know, just to just to keep you alive, you know, just to, you know, and I think we're, I, I bet you're probably surprised, maybe in a good way, after you put yourself out there, and it goes, well, like, hey, that was pretty cool. You know, I challenged myself and, uh, and it turned out great. I'm glad I took my, uh, you know, the risk. I took it out for a spin versus staying, uh, you know, safe and letting barnacles collect on the hull of the ship and, and the quote unquote safe harbor. Well, absolutely. The whole podcast is based on me getting out of my shell to some degree because it's I am not a good networker and I'm not a good I'm good on site. I because I guess my brain can rationalize the fact. Hey, this is an event. You're being paid to be there. You need to interact with folks, not because you need more business, because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to represent whoever hired you the best you possibly can. And being engaging, polite and nice and interactive is part of that. Uh, I know some people do right. it just because they want to get the next gig, and I, I don't think that way. It's like, yeah. no, they're not only paying me to speak yeah. for an hour. They're paying me to say hello to people and, and be respectful and be nice and be a, be someone they want to they want to talk to. I completely agree, and I think, too, if you have that right spirit of I'm going to do the right thing here and help out and, and put myself out there, I think it's often a better way to have the gigs come than you can tell when someone's a little too – hypey, you know, a little too salesy, a little too uh, out there. And and a lot of people do it well. You know, God bless them, but I think there's a lot of times when you can people see right through that. You know, they go, eh, a little, little, little cheesy. Well, the last thing I want to talk to you about is often happens at the end of any breakout session or sometimes even a keynote, which is rare, but on a keynote, but it's the Q&A that happens. How can you handle questions, especially since you don't know what they're going to ask? I mean, you're doing well today because we didn't really sit there you have no list of questions in front of you you know you don't you don't know right. what i'm going to ask uh, how i mean i'm reading off the script i'm reading off the script you gave me but yeah it's, it's that, a little stilted really I, if we could do it on the second take it'll be much better but, okay no, sorry. no i'm kidding you're right but uh 
how do you handle questions confidently? Because I think a lot of the times it's the stammering and the thinking that makes people's credibility go away, even if the answer is insightful and good. Right. I, first of all, I think people need to give themselves a, a break. I don't think most audiences are expecting their, their speaker to be Google. I mean, I could be wrong. But most of the time, they don't want you to be Google. Yes, they want you to be an expert and have a good answer. But I think if people will give them the escape valve of being confident enough to say, I don't know, or I'd like to look into that further, or I can give you a, a top-line answer. Here's my, my gut, but I would, love to, I would love to dig deeper to give you the best possible answer. Heck, I've been up there where people ask me stuff before, and I will say, hey, I don't really have that answer right now. But I appreciate the question. By the way, I would say to people, try not to say a good question or not. Because if you say, oh, great question or good question, either you end up saying that to everybody and it minimizes the good, you know, the, the superlative, now everybody has a C grade or whatever. Or if you say good question to most but not all, you run the risk of saying uh, great question, great question, great question, and then to the key decision maker, whoever it is in the room, oh, the question was, and then they end up kind of feeling like like an idiot. But, um, but I'd say buy yourself some time to think, and the, the easiest ways to do that are to repeat the question out loud, to take a deep breath as you think what you want to say. And t trust me, as you pause after someone asks a question, you will draw the audience in. They will be like, ooh, what's this person going to say now? And even giving yourself a – let's give ourselves a two-second pause right now. I'm going to time it. Ready? Okay, that was a full two-second pause right there. Now, it can seem like an eternity to you, the speaker, but boy, it, it's wonderful to the audience. It lets your brain think what you want to say. And then, and then having done all that, repeat the question, put it out there, pause a little bit. And then if you do actually realize you don't have the answer, then you say, gosh, I don't have that information right now, or I'd love to give you a better answer versus kind of a half-baked one, and then here's what I try to do. If you will see me afterwards, I'd be happy to get your information, and I will get back to you. And I always like to say, I'll get back to you by end of day Friday. I'll get back to you first thing tomorrow. I can get back to you within the week. And then what I found is one of two things will happen. After that, let's say you have 100 people in your audience, and you answer most questions, but maybe one or two you couldn't. Most of the time you say, hey, come see me afterwards. I'm happy to track down the information and get back to you. You will never hear from that person again. Like, you know, they really weren't that interested in the first place. Or for the folks that do, they come down, you strike up a conversation, you get their contact information, you track down the, the info, you get back to them, and you, you illustrate to them that you are a person of your word, you follow up when you say you will, you are attentive, you care about them, that whole thing. And then the, the final little happy benefit is if you have the wherewithal to say, I don't know, or I, I, I just don't know that answer, I don't feel confident giving you something that's not fully thought through, whatever, then you imply that when you do answer a question, that you're 100% truthful. Like, okay, when she answers a question, but once in a while she'll say, I don't know, or he does the same thing, you then imply that every time I do answer, you can take it to the bank. It's researched. It's well, I got good background. This guy tells the truth. It's a beautiful thing. But they also have the confidence to say, you know, I don't know. And once people have the ability and the freedom to say, I don't know, pretty much the Q&A session becomes a no a, not so much a no-brainer, but what's the threat? You have the freedom to say, I don't know the questions you don't know, and then everything else you answer appropriately, and, and you're a superstar. So um, you know, it's, it's just giving people the freedom to say, mm. you know, I don't know, and, and tr uh, trust me, I think the audience will, will appreciate that. Well, my guest today was Steve Hughes. You're going to be in Denver at the Association of Legal Administrators National Conference, Wednesday, April 5th, from 3 to 4.15, and the session is Captivate Presentations that Engage and Win Over Today's Distracted Audience. So for people who are not going to be able to attend or not part of ALA, where can people find you? They can find me all over. I'll be at the corner of Wilshire and – no, just kidding. Uh, I will be – I'll be here till 4.00. Um, my website is hityourstride.com, just like the running term, hityourstride.com, or you can find me on Twitter, at Steve Hughes. Yes, I'm an early adapter, no numbers, at Steve Hughes. And uh, those are the main ways. I also respond to telegrams and smoke signals, too, but those are the, the best ways, the first two I mentioned. Well, now that I have, I have your personal cell phone number, I will definitely call you sometime between 3 and 4.15 with horrible, horrible things. Now that I know that Perfect. that's what you I would do. love that. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. Would, that would make my day. <laughs> I will believe me. I will. I will think for the next month some creative things to, to think to, to to send you in the middle of your presentation. That would be awesome. I would love that. But no, I really appreciate you interviewing me, Craig. And and for the folks who can be there, ALA, we'd love to see you at my session. And for those who can't, you know, check out my website. That'd be wonderful too. That's the show. Thanks to Steve for previewing his session. Don't miss him on the fifth at three p.m. I will be presenting on the 4th at both 1015 and 245. Go to alanet.org for more information. If you have questions, comments, or guest suggestions, email Craig at speakercraigprice.com. Head over to realitycheckpodcast.com, and while you're there, sign up for the newsletter. If you like what you hear, please leave a review on iTunes. See you in Denver. See you next week.